people have been looking for uh, creative ways of increasing their their outputs using the small the small lands that they have. And uh, owing to this, we've we've had so many um, we've had so many implications and impacts on the on the in the sector and the environment and everything. And so. And so it will be very important to just go through them. And uh, the first one you can see, the, the system has been changing from rural to very urban areas. Because you see now, most rural, rural areas have become more urbanized in different, in various parts of the continent. And so very many um, industrial systems are coming into the urban areas. And also there is not the extensive grazing to intensive, because now there's no, there's no enough land to uh, extensively graze the property, the, the animals, and so people are going going after the confined grain fed operations, and also there's a small scale privately owned farms to large corporate corporized uh, operations. This is because you see, um, as people continue increasing in skill and lessening the economies of scale, they tend to have bigger and bigger corporations, and this is what has been. Um, actually, the, the the big the big the big problem in this sector, as you know, most of our our countries in Africa, we have the we have a system where it's always the elite who end up uh, getting benefits from such practices, and so the small scale farmers end up not uh, being able to to get reap the, all the reap all the benefits of the of the system. And you know, so we can we know that the practices are believed, like we see the the confined grain operations. They believed people believe that they they will they will they'll they'll be there. The, the solution for global food security. But you see, sir, studies have shown that small farmers still produce over 70% of the food. And uh, and so it's not really necessary to have factory farming because already whatever is, is there, it can, be, it can be enough for everyone. And also, because of these systems, you've had negative outcomes of them. Is the first one is um, there's the re re reduced food balance. This is to say that the amount of food that is being used by the by the industrial agriculture, um, they can also be they can just they can be diverted to the the people and so even care the the food security. This is to say that we have the soy, we have the soy, we have sorghum, which are which are now being opted for in the agricultural sector, and these are very good options for. For people, and so and then you see the amount of quantity of food that they are using in the systems are more than how much food is, food is being produced by them by the animals. So you can see really that's a, that's already a negative outcome because we talk about the proportionality of how much uh, food you are getting is not as much as we want or wish. And also, uh, there's the life, life, livestock agriculture is dependent on fossil fuels. Um, yeah, and so with this, you know, uh, right now we have the we need to reduce the temperature to uh, like at, uh, over two two degrees Celsius, and you know we cannot do that if we're continually increasing the 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 emissions, and if we continually increase the the quantity or uh, the livestock sector to be a bigger a bigger bigger than how it is right now, we might we might continue increasing the emissions, which is which will be detrimental to us. And also, um, livestock sector is the biggest sectoral source of environmental pollution. This is owing to the waste. You know, the waste. Not many, not many uh, countries have been able to come up with a system where they they turn the the waste to to resources. And so this is this is continually going to our lakes and our oceans, which is and then um, uh, polluting and degrading our coral coral reefs. And also there's the use of antibiotics, these hormones, uh, fertilizers, and you know, if the, the waste, if they have all these chemicals, they even affect the soil itself and the soil quality. And also there is the increased public health hazard. This is because of the, the increased antibiotics, which are sometimes resistant. And you know, if they are exposed, they can still, these, these pathogens are still, they're still alive even after. After they come out of the with the with the soil or the water, and so when people take them, then you have this problem of the zoonosis, zootic diseases, and everything. So you can see all these things are moving around and affecting us directly. And also there's a deforestation and lag fragmentation. You know, if you want to have a big industry, we'll have to to convert um, a property into the the system. And so most of the more often than not, the initially clearing of 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 land or forest to have to have these companies and also to have these other like to grow the soy or the sorghum or the nipia grasses 
And so this one is not sustainable in, in as such because now the more property, the more land that is needed for for forests is not there anymore. And so there's the growing inequalities of the scale of production. You know, definitely if the people are going to get who are going to to get the advantages of the large scale will be the big ones. And you always have to remember that some of the things that the governments put do not always benefit the the small shareholder. They always benefit the person who has a large scale. And in, in this case, the, the big corporations will continue becoming bigger and bigger at the expense of the small ones, because even the small opportunity that the small scale farmer can, can get will be very limited. And so even uh, it will be very difficult for them to even um, compete with these big corporations. Yeah, and also here in this, in this part, so we need to recognize that various people have the, they have the, they are placed differently in the spectrum because see we have the men and the women and also we need to know that how do we use the scarce public resources to 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 be spread across everyone in the spectrum yeah and so on the on the recommendations um definitely the policymakers need to need to really look at this look at this uh problem in a very uh holistic and very broad spectrum. I mean, know that you have to look for the low hanging fruit. Even though, right, like right now, I know most countries have not um, have not um, ratified the the UDAO, the Universal Declaration of Animal Welfare, and so, um, but even though they they have accepted, they have not yet really incorporated it to their laws. And so, we need to policymakers need to look at it in a very holistic way and look at other ways of how we can supplement and complement the animal welfare laws and even look at ways of how we can reduce all these impacts and these negative trade-offs in the, in the system. So we can look at it in terms of uh, maybe environment, look at it in terms of public health. So how can we increase or make our policies better so that we can go to have a ripple effect in the agricultural sector. And so even taking the one, one health, one welfare approach is very important because this one takes, up, takes cognizant of all these factors and it will be it will be easier for us to have a better way of uh, dealing with this issue even before it comes it comes down to in the intensified way in our continent and also we have to embrace transformative activities such as the conservation agriculture this is the agro uh, ecology where we where we need to come up with ways of how to have regenerative agricultural system which restores degraded land uh, much faster. And with this, we can be able to now maybe convert some of the properties or other that have already been degraded, even have the, have already been polluted to another way. And also we need to now try and um, reduce the, the, the agricultural or rather reduce the, the sector or rather try and find other opportunities to come up, to come up with options for food. And you remember there's a difference to nutrition and food security. So we should not always opt for the meat, sec meat options because they more often than not, they're not even as nutritious as the as a food food options. And this will be very, it will be very good. And if policymakers embrace this, it will be very good for us. And then embrace sustainable nature-based solutions. Nature always has the result, rather has the answers to all our problems. They always say nature takes care of itself. So how can we go back to nature and get the the and we try and reverse all this pollution and uh, environmental degradation that we have right now. So we need to look for such such ways and even incorporate these societies. Like we have uh, the indigenous communities in our in our societies. How can we incorporate their ways of doing doing their agriculture, or how can we incorporate their ways of doing livestock agriculture? So it's all the uh, ways that we can, or the policymakers can venture into, so that they can be able to make it. Uh, better, no, yeah, and then there's education and awareness. Um, education is, is very critical. Like we have to make people understand that why we need to go this way, like the sustainable way, because people may may just be looking at it in an economical way. So then, how can we make our our activities more informative and let them understand the implications or the negative effects of the industrialized uh, production because most most farmers just see in terms of how much money am I, am I going to make is it is it less uh, how much uh, if you check on the economies of scale are they lower or are they higher or um, am I going to use more resources or not and and then they'll be say they'll say maybe it has less space I don't have I don't use lots of uh, money in purchasing more land but then to understand why we need to go back to a natural 
natural conservation uh, type of way of growing our agriculture. Yeah, and then if any questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Judy. Well, I, I hope that all of you have enjoyed this amazing presentation. It's really interesting and worried at the same time. All the problems related to health, deforestation, and impacts in forests, of course, and in people that this kind of industry have had in Africa, but also in the world. So, well, we will have also more time to discuss about this policy framework solutions and talk more about this topic. So please, if you have uh, questions, don't hesitate to send it through the chat. Um, now I would like to give the welcome, a warm welcome to Tosi Sokupa. Tosi, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe can you turn on your camera? Thank you so much, Tosi. Well, now um, I'm very glad to welcome you. Uh, Tosi is from the Coalition of African Animal Welfare Organizations in South Africa. Uh, Tosi is a member uh, also of the African Union's uh, platform for animal welfare and serve on the coordination committee for the implementation of the Africa Strategy for Animal Welfare. He has led the animal welfare portfolio for the South African Veterinary Council since 2016 to 2019. And he serves on the International Policy Forum of World Animal Net and is member of the International Coalition for Animal Welfare, which is the collaborating partner to the World Organization for Animal Health, OIE. Uh, thank you, Tosi. Today he will present a very interesting topic that it's named Follow the Money, Industrial Farming in Africa. So, well, welcome once again, Tosi, and the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the Global uh, Forest Coalition for inviting Kao to be, to be part of this amazing uh, uh, topic and uh, with an amazing group of people. Just wanted to confirm, are you Isis or Milena? <laughs> Milena. I, I am Milena, yes. All right, All right Milena, <laughs> thank you. Uh, can, I, can I share my screen as well? Uh, yes, of course, sure. A few slides. You can stop me if I'm going over, overboard, over. <laughs> uh, I, I, might, I might just do that. <laughs> okay, I will take time. Yeah, uh, does he adjust our recommendation? If maybe, can you speak closer to your microphone? Maybe, maybe can you hear me now? Is it yeah. better now? Yeah, it's better. It's better? Thank okay. you. Let me, let me rather just hold it next to my mouth. Uh, okay, here we are. Share. Can you see my screen? Melina just wanted to call. Uh, the, can, can, now, can you see it? Yes, yes, now we can see. Okay, all right. You have already made the introduction. Thank you very much, Melina. And uh, once again, thanks for the, for the opportunity to, to present to you. Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky um, topic. You know, you, you do want to follow the money, but the money is really hidden. In, um, in, in, in different, <laughs> I'll call them portfolios for lack of a better word. So it's difficult to actually see where the money is. But I just wanted to give a brief intro by
by um, by by noting the, the following uh, comments. You know, in 2014, the African continent had about roughly seven billion people, the population that is. And of course, it is estimated by that by 2030, there'll be roughly 1.5 billion. And of course, by 2050, there will be, oh no, this is, this is of course the, the world population, right? But in, in, on the African continent, we're looking at uh, about 1.5 billion people by 2030. And we will double our current number come 2050. And we, the estimate is that there will be roughly about 2.4 billion people on the continent. And of course, with this increasing number of people, it means increasing number of stomachs to be fed. And, um, and uh, uh, animal protein, of course, is one of the uh, um, uh, items on the menu. And the question now is how are we going to feed that population which will double by 2050 if, as uh, Judy has mentioned, that we only have 20% of arable land currently. And um, also another thing to note is that um, there is an estimation of about 70% of animals uh, that are farmed uh, 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 in, in, in these uh, concentrated animal um, uh, uh, feeding uh, 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 systems or CAFOs and also factory farms, if uh, we can use that, that, that wedding. And, but the African continent, how does it fare to, to, to that or where or which or what role does it play with regards to this 70%? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say uh, that only 30% of agriculture or livestock agriculture on the African continent is, uh, is industrialized or is, uh, is in factory farms. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to share the, the references to, to all of these uh, facts that I, I, I bring up. And, um, and the question then maybe which arises is that would, would Africa want to also play a big part in that? Would they want to increase the industrialization? And what would it take for, for, for Africa to do that? Uh, our governments, for example, do they have an appetite to, to, to do such? And um, another point to note is that uh, the meat production in the least developed countries, which many are in, of course, uh, Asia and Africa and maybe some uh, how Latin America as well, they've doubled the, the meat production in the last two decades. And of course, this will also double in the next two to three decades or even treble. The question is, what kind of system are we going to embrace or our government's going to embrace? And of course, when we embrace industrial agriculture, it means then that uh, more money needs to be pumped in into those systems. And then there's an example here of current beef. Current beef is uh, in South Africa, about 1,700 kilometers away I'm at. I'm currently near Cape Town, and current beef is in and around uh, near Johannesburg in the Gauteng province. And in one of their feedlots or in their feedlots, at any given time, they have roughly 150,000 head of cattle. You know, that needs to be fed and of course watered. I mean, can you, can you imagine? I know in the US, I mean, this is maybe a norm in, 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 in states like Texas and so on, but uh, this is one company in one country when, with 150,000 head of cattle. And this is, this is way bigger than the, 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 the peak production, for example, of the whole country. And we're talking about one, one, one family, one family uh, uh, business here. I mean, South Africa has um, roughly an estimate of 125,000 sows um, with regards to pigs. And, and this particular farm has 150,000 head of cattle. Uh, we don't want to imagine the environment around that feedlot. 
And of course, it is estimated that the consumption of beef on the continent will increase by 200 percent between 2015 and 2050. And and of course, as activists and also organizations that are working in this uh, in this space and in this field, this is of concern to us. But it also shows us where we need to put our energy on or add. And if we are going to have a 200 percent increase in in beef, and we've just heard from Judy now the impact on the environment of uh, factory farming, it means we will have to do more uh, to, to, to really curb this increase. And, and of course, uh, poultry consumption will grow uh, about 200, 210%, and also pork uh, will also, the, the consumption grow about 200% in 2050. This is now for the whole of the continent. What is our current status? Uh, according to Fitch, consumer demand for beef will exceed, I mean, we've just mentioned partly some of this in our last slide, will exceed 450,000 tons in 2023. This is, this is in two years time. It's not probably even two years. Yeah, it's roughly two years time or even 18 months time or so. But the domestic industry will only be capable of delivering some 370,000 tons. Now, this is of beef, of course. Now, the question here is, uh, as much as in, in, in 2003, uh, according to the Malabu Declaration, where African governments were, were committing 10% of their GDP to, um, to agriculture, we know that less than 10 of the 54 countries, less than 10 of them, I think it's about six of them, actually uh, 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 meeting that 10 culture and the rest are, are way far from that. And it, it then means that if, um, if uh, we cannot meet the demand on the African continent, definitely other countries like China and maybe the Middle East would either want to come in on the continent and invest here or we will import from them in the coming years. And um, secondly, the production will not keep pace with consumption. And, and, and this, is, this is the view of, um, of the United Nations FAO as well, that, uh, that even if we were to increase and try and industrialize, chances are we won't necessarily go the route of, uh, of the US and other Western countries or even maybe China. And, and, and that, is, um, that is also amplified by this last uh, sentence or statement here that there's a growing awareness that an industrialized model of agriculture culture may not be appropriate for other African states. Of course, this could be climate, this could be environment, this could be infrastructure as well, this could be policies, and uh, this could be lack of, uh, lack of uh, direct investment as well from, um, from, um, from development banks. So, so it's, it really begs the question then, if the growth will indeed take place, what kind of form will it take? And that's, uh, that should be an interesting sort of answer to, to, to find in the next coming years as we operate in this space. I wanted to, to, to share this. And, and, and of course, I mean, if we look at 2050 and if we were to ask ourselves, what is it that we would advocate for? If you look at this graph, you, you see that milk and beef are two main areas that Africa will focus on and then followed uh, by poultry. So this is, this is where the continent is envisioned to go. And if, I mean, look at the million tons uh, compared to 2005 and 2007, by 2030, we're looking at about 24.8. And then again, on 2050, about 82.6 million tons by then. And of course, both milk and beef production contributes tremendously negatively to the environment. 
As mentioned before, beef and milk will be the largest markets by value for animal proteins in 2050. That value will be close to 50 billion and 45 billion respectively. And then of course, the number of commercial livestock enterprises across Africa is still small. But what is of concern is that that number is slightly growing. And Africans themselves, by the way, are seeing uh, investment opportunities in these mega factory farms. In 2018, Africa received 52% of the development flows to agriculture. And chances are, as we struggle to feed the world and as Africa has cheap labor, uh, this 52% will definitely increase in the coming years. Here, I wanted to, to share with the colleagues um, uh, uh, about the, this inflow of, uh, of, of monies, where is it directed to? According to the OECD, this is, the, this is their latest um, uh, uh, report, you can see there on those graphs that most of the attention is paid into the development and also the education and training and somewhat extension sort of services as well. And then followed by policy and administration management together with research. And in the past couple of years, water resources was also, was also the main uh, the main domain in terms of uh, in terms of investments now what this tells me is that the the, the continent is preparing itself for uh, better production models in the coming years if we are now focusing on education and training and also policy and, and, and research. It means in the next two, three, four, five years, when that research is out, when the development is there, when also there's uh, 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 enough people uh, or organizations educated and trained, I, I think we will go full force into factory farming mode, uh, depending of course on which country uh, will take the lead and South Africa and Nigeria, Thus far, Kenya and Egypt are looking to play a critical role with that regard, meaning that there is interest uh, from those countries when it comes to industrializations of uh, animals. And then this is this is what I've been asked to talk about, and, and I've already made an a, an excuse, I guess, uh, in the beginning of the talk that uh, it's it's difficult to follow this money. You you try, but you cannot find it. I mean, um, prominent donors to Africa, in particular China and Brazil, do not report their development assistance to the OECD, for example. So uh, if they don't report, how will we know? Um, so we look at World Bank, IFC, African Development. Development Bank, China Investment Bank, China Development Bank, and so on. Try and see uh, and comb through uh, their reports and see how much money really goes into agriculture projects and what kind of projects are those. Uh, 19 billion US dollars was invested in the Sub Saharan Africa uh, compared to more than 100 billion in East Asia and also 50 billion in China alone. This was now in 2018. Uh, I, I, and this tells you as well that uh, if, uh, if such amounts are coming in on the continent, it means then that there's definitely this lack of infrastructure, infrastructure and also development and probably training as well. Hence, monies are currently now going to development and training so that once we are ready, I foresee this, uh, this investment going up doubling or trebling when uh, uh, our ducks are in a row, uh, so to speak. And then the capital investment levels in agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa are still very much low, according to IRLI, according to FAO, according to the World Bank as well. But there is definitely an appetite to increase these investments to higher levels. And that, of course, unfortunately bodes uh, not well because it means factory farms. The top 10 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa with the highest agricultural GFCF, which stands for Gross Fixed Capital Formation, which generally means investment, especially investments in assets that could uh, produce more products. 
uh, Nigeria is, uh, is, is number one, uh, South Africa is number two, and then Sudan and Ethiopia follow suit. But these are the countries, I guess, even if we were to work together and collaborate as, as colleagues and organizations, these are the countries that we should be looking at when it comes to uh, uh, factory farms mushrooming up in the next coming years. Uh, as recently as it's now November, I mean, as recently as two months ago, uh, Tanzania was also calling for, for, for organizations, for people, for investors to come and invest in, in agriculture in Tanzania. And then one of the items that they've, uh, they've highlighted was both aquaculture and also, of course, livestock farming together with uh, crops, of course. Well, a concluding remarks, uh, colleagues and Melina, is that the population of the African continent will increase, it will double, and therefore it's no brainer that the consumption of animal protein will also double the question or even treble. The question is how will that consumption or how will that meat be produced? And of course, there's, uh, there's unemployment, there's poverty and inequality. There will still be unemployment, poverty and inequality. And these are the items that will be highlighted when people and organizations and companies, private sector are wanting to invest in factory farms. Uh, most developed countries, most developed will embrace the industrial farming systems. When I say most developed, I mean countries like South Africa now, Kenya, Nigeria, those that have infrastructure will definitely embrace the concept of factor farming, except if we act now. And the time to create that awareness is definitely yesterday and not tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention, and uh, I will welcome any 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 questions or comment, uh, Melina and goes. Thank you so so much, Tosi. It's a really interesting presentation, and well, it's really impressive to hear about these worried and significant figures in terms of impacts that uh, this mean of production is getting in land and environment. So I, I also want to remark a very interesting question that you made. Uh, it's about what kind of system we want to embrace, especially when we see the, percent, the percentage of investments in countries such as Africa that are being also promoting by financial institutions. So thank you so, so much. Um, we have a couple of questions that we will um, share at the end of all presentations. Uh, but now I also want to give a um, brief introduction to Janice Cox. Um, Janice, well, her video is not working, so we will only hear uh, about her insights. But I want to present Janice before to start with her presentation. She is a co-founder and director of World Animal Net. She lives in South Africa and works on international policy on animal issues. Janice has worked as a management consultant for animal welfare and development with a focus on Africa. This work includes a research and advocacy project on the detrimental impacts of industrial animal agriculture in developing countries and one of and one year for the World Organization of Animal Health OIE on the development of a regional animal welfare strategy for Southern Africa. So welcome, Janice. Thank you uh, for accept this invitation. And well, the floor is also yours this time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Milena. I hope you can hear me if you can't see me. <laughs> we can hear you perfectly. Wonderful. So um, I'll try and share my screen because I did pull together some slides. So, so luckily you'll have something to look at. So I'll try now to share my screen. OK. 
can you see that? No, now. No. Now? No. Let me try. Maybe I can share your presentation. Okay, thanks, Milena. Let's give me a second, please. Can you see now? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, so yes, I just wanted to add a bit. Um, I haven't got all the detailed information that Tozy had, thankfully. Thanks, Tozy. But I just wanted to share another few thoughts. Um, next, thank you. Um, so, One of the things, as, as I think Tozy did bring out, um, that occurred to me is that um, one of the kind of underlying drivers of this is the importance that is put on economic growth as a development paradigm instead of well-being. Um, and interesting again, the World Bank has said that SDG 8 is an African priority which is decent work and economic growth. Um, now that all fuels this kind of export orientation, um, the commoditized approach to agriculture, uh, as opposed to you'd think that in Africa, SDG 2, zero hunger, would be prioritized. And UNDP says that undernourishment and severe food insecurity is increasing in almost all areas of Africa. So although there's extreme hunger, um, decent work and economic growth are prioritized. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. So the, um, the whole kind of the political system repeats this. So the African Union has the Malibu Declaration which concentrates on accelerated agricultural growth and it talks of ending hunger by doubling agricultural productivity by 2025. It includes livestock and it's got a focus on development partners, so rallying and aligning support with that aim. Uh, next slide please. So also under the African Union, there's a livestock development strategy for 2015 to 2035, um, which was pulled together with a grant from the Gates Foundation. And this talks about it increasing production to meet demand. And it talks about this increased demand from increased urban populations and rising incomes. So there again, this demand is not um, hunger focused, not food security focused, but for urban populations, rising incomes. And the agencies FAO, OIE and ILRI all provide technical support for this livestock development strategy. Uh, next slide, please. So now looking at um, South Africa. Um, South Africa has its own livestock development strategy and this focuses very much on previously disadvantaged. Um, as Tozi will know better than I do, but that, that they call them emerging farmers. And um, when I did some research a long while ago, I looked at the training of these emerging farmers and they're actually training them on small scale factory farming systems. So not, not really appropriate given the high technology, the fact that there's a lot of labor in South Africa, um, but these are high technology, high input systems. Um, the livestock development strategy also mentions international competitiveness and profitability, and also the sustainable use and management of the natural resource 
space because that includes um, wildlife in farming as well. Uh, next slide. So the NAPAD used to be the new economic partnership for Africa's development, but it's now an African development agency, so a homegrown development agency, and it falls under the African Union. And this interfaces with all Africa's development stakeholders and development partners and fosters cooperation with the private sector. And industrialization is actually one of its pillars and technology as well. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So under NAPAD is a program called the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program. And that's a framework program which sees agriculture as a pivotal role in development. And it's about boosting investment to stimulate growth in agriculture. And I pulled out two of the major reforms that the CADAP champions are 6% annual growth in agricultural GDP and at least 10% of public expenditure to go to agriculture. So that shows a, a clear export orientation to the livestock develop, development programs. Uh, next slide, please. But um, one thing I wanted to focus on was the whole new lens after COVID and a reassessment of food systems. And that could be something that would work in, the favor, in our favor. I mean, one thing is that the food insecurity in Africa was really shown up by COVID and the vulnerability of an export model when you have lockdowns. Also the, the kind of interlinkages between animal, human and ecosystem health. And although COVID was, um, was started from wildlife, there's also this massive disease ground in intensive animal agriculture. And so now people are looking at building back better. All of this is coming under scrutiny. Uh, next slide, please. So the United Nations Environment Programme have been looking at prevention of pandemics and talking about building back better with transformation of food systems. And there seems to be growing awareness that our food systems are broken. And in particular, the role of industrial animal agriculture and the wildlife trade and the need to move towards dietary change um, from health and safety perspective, as well as environment. I mean, we've spoken about the immense environmental problems, um, particularly through meat and dairy eating. Thank you. Next chat. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we did some work on um, post-COVID recovery because there have been now over $10 trillion being pushed into COVID recovery. And we wanted to, you know, try and make sure that that is building back better. And so a group of us um, carried out some advocacy with all major international financial institutions. Uh, we found out that institutions like the International Finance Corporation, the European Investment Bank, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development were still funding industrial animal agriculture, despite the fact that this is still a, a COVID risk factor, or, or sorry, a disease and pandemic risk factor. Um, but interestingly, we had a letter from the African Development Bank, which confirmed that it was not supporting any wildlife farming, that um, it focused on extensive livestock, 
um, favor to one health approach and even quoted this nice saying, the interconnection between people, animals, plants and our shared environment. Um, so so um, top marks for the African Development Bank, not so much for the European and international. Uh, so um, next, next slide, please. So interesting things happening um, in the wake of COVID. There's been a real increase in back, gar back gardens, growing veggies, community and school veggie gardens. And this is happening, I, I understand, it's happening in South Africa, but it's happening in a number of um, African countries. Uh, next slide, thank you. So, there have been some lovely um, stories about great success with permaculture in Malawi, sustainable um, and good regenerative agroecological system with low inputs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Agroecology and organic agriculture, um, with more than half of Africans being smallholder farmers, um, there is scope and this can help sustainability and food security. And uh, many of these already use agroecological principles. But the annoying thing is, while there's all this money going into factory farming, these producers struggle to get certification because of bureaucracy and lack of finance. So there's not yet the political support for these methods. Um, and post COVID, I mean, small and medium sized enterprises will be the future of livelihoods and of food security. And so this should really be the way to go. Thanks. Next slide. And uh, the next thing I wanted to mention was, um, the abundance of African plant-based superfoods, things like moringa and teff and phonio and amaranth, baobab. Now these, are, they're very sought after now in the global north and they're, they're attracting good price premiums, but they're never discussed in discussions on food security in Africa. Uh, next slide, please. And so that brings me to, I wanted to address, maybe controversial, but I wanted to address a couple of nice African myths and legends. Um, the first one is that traditional African diets were meat-based. Um, they were not. <laughs> they have become meat-based. Um, and mainly it's a kind of when people get wealthier, they want to emulate uh, the eating patterns of the global north, highly meat based, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, the other myth and le legend is that meat and dairy are needed to supplement diets. They're not needed. Um, there are, there is supplementation, there may be B12 and iron deficiencies, they can be supplemented, they can be found in different plant feeds. And this is more a case of aspirational diets and taste based. And there's also in um, wealthier populations in Africa, there's a rise in obesity and non-communicable diseases. And so the debate is not held on should there be education and awareness around the need for changing diets? And I'd like to hear more of, um, more of that debate and what could be done to change diets. So I quickly put, picked, quickly put a photo of me on the last slide. So although my video doesn't work, just to say hi and thank you. Thank you very much. You. Oh, you didn't. Of course, you didn't see that because I popped it on my copy and I didn't share, but never mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Thank you so much. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. So, yeah, I just want to say thanks a lot. Uh, it seems like each day it's more clear how it's an entire system pushing for economic interest and the importance of, of continue increasing awareness 
about the close relation between human and environmental health, and of course the fact that financial institutions are really important actors under these projects. But, but it's also interesting to know and to see that we have a seed of hope with the agroecological agro initiatives. And at this point, remark that we have also too much work to do in the future, and also remark the importance to promote these initiatives that are really um, well crucial for nutrition, health, and sustainability. So thank you so much, Janice. Uh, well, we hope to see you next time. Mm, by the moment, uh, I want to also give the welcome to John Cisa. Um, John um, holds, uh, I don't know if maybe you can turn on your camera, John. Mm. If we can't hear you. Thank you very much, Milena, for giving me the floor. I think uh, my predecessors have uh, outlined, highlighted many issues. My name is John Sisa. Uh, I, I talk to you from uh, the Dem Democratic Republic of uh, Congo, the RC. I uh, work uh, with the Common uh, Front on Protection of Environment and uh, Protected Areas. I, I just, uh, John, I, I want to, I'm sorry. I just want to give the your introduction, John, if it's okay with you. Hello, Hello John. I'm sorry, John. Yeah. Uh, I just want to give a brief introduction about your studies and previous achievements. I just want to check that you can hear hear well. Well, so yeah, thank you, John. Uh, just quick introduction, John. John holds a master's degree in peace and reconciliation, focused in natural resources, environment, peace and sustainable development at the Catholic University of Bukavu as well as a bachelor degree in law at the official University of Bukabu. John is a university teacher, researcher, and national coordinator of the nonprofit organization known as the Common Front of the Protection of the Environment and Protected Areas. Acronym, uh, well, it's quite long to pronounce, but it's a partner organization of the Global Forest Coalition and is also the national focal point of civil society organizations in DRC accredited to the United Nations Convention to combat desertification. So John will speak today about the impact of unsustainable livestock farming on forest and forest dependent peoples in the territories of Menga, Kabare and Kaleje in South Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you so much, John. Um, I don't know if maybe you can turn on your camera. If you can, it's okay. If not, don't worry. Uh, just try to speak slow and, and to use your microphone near to your, to your head, to your mouth, please. Thank you, John. So you, you can start now. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup, 
la Thank you very much. So, give me the possibility to talk. So, apologies in advance for the bad quality of my microphone. <laughs> oh, it's hard to he hear him. I would like to exchange with other panelists on the impact of livestock production for uh, the guardians of uh, forests in uh, the South Kivu uh, province in the uh, Repu uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, as you know, as you can see on the world map, this is the biggest country in Africa. It owns, owns a huge amount of, um, of surface. very difficult to understand. In general and in South Kivu especially, regarding the demography, because of the demography, now it's necessary to see how the impact of forest use on uh, the guardians on the forests. We can see that because of population growth and change in food, their impacts there is an impact on environment and also on the quality of air, water, the soil, the forests, on the land use and the agrobiodiversity. Now that we would like to see the impact on livestock and on forests in the context of the RC and in the region of South Kivu, and in the uh, in other region, Mangan Kale, where we have been working, we have seen that livestock farming is one of the cause of the environmental issues of our time. The loss of the forest love, the land degradation, uh, the contamination, the pollution of atmosphere, the loss of loss of biodiversity, the um, ecosystem preservation. Some of these livestock in these regions have lost a lot of forest because of so-called sustainable development in the change of land use and on production of, um, of food for livestock with practices such as uh, cutting down trees and uh, bushfires and other methods that are problematic. So it is a threat on biodiversity. So uh, livestock farming is a threat to biodiversity. So the impact In the context of DRC, it's not, it's not questionable that this also leads to impact on a, the guardian communities of the forest, especially in the uh, territories of Bulunga, Kalal, and Kale. We also saw that uh, women have are specifically impacted. It's 
especially because of the fact of collecting water, of cleaning tools that are used, and working for um, the farm owners for very low salaries. And there is a, a clear violation of women's rights. There is a pressure on natural resources in South Kifu that uh, enhance the pressure on uh, guardian populations of forests. And business man Uh, come to the forest to get several uh, forestry resources. Which lead to the violation of the rights of several communities on the ground. And because there are also bad uh, policies. And they, in all these communities, the women don't have any voice, they can't uh, speak, they, don't, they can't watch TV. So it's hard for them to reclaim their rights. 60, they don't have access to land rights either. So the situation is very tense. What can be the influence of farm, livestock farming on a DRC a government? There is a geological scandal on the, in the area of mining and also on agriculture. So all of these businessmen, political people and all influence some policies that should make improvement at the level, uh, social and economic level. The domain of uh, livestock farming is very important uh, socially and economically in DRC. The agro-pastoralist uh, activities are also really important in some of the region in DRC. And it's, and then businessmen, uh, political men also gain profits from their policies which affects directly the society. Which prevent local communities from gaining a social improvement. So there's nothing initiated in favor of of local communities, but only on the sectors that are privileged by, um, by the politics. And there's no um, move toward having a um, more sustainable livestock farming because the impact on environment is due to bad political practice on the land. So non-sustainable farming has an impact on environment because it contributes to a carbon gas emissions, water pollution and biodiversity loss, which changes the condition, the living condition of uh, people that depend on forest 
until damaging and threatening their rights to land. This situation is that now there are a lot of conflicts because of a natural resources in protected areas as well. Some are threatened, although they are registered in international registries of protected areas. They are threatened not only in terms of, in economical terms, but also in terms of the biodiversity. So we should make improvements on that, not only for the present generations, but also to support the SDGs in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for your presentation and your time. It's absolutely important uh, this perspective around the impacts of livestock on forest in DRC. And also to remark something that we also try to use as part of the, you know, our work is around the women impacts uh, that have been always a preoccupation that is still increasing. So it's important to continue working on that to increase gender perspective, awareness, and of course, again, remark the importance of adequate policies, adequate framework policy, and also the, important, uh, the importance of agropastoralism as a solution that it's also far from the common use of land, something that you also remark and we really appreciate, John, your perspective, your insights, and of course, all of you are, well, attendees are welcome to share your questions. And in the, to, to finish with the presentations, I also want to, say welcome to Kwame, Kwame Ponso. Um, good morning, Kwame. Nice to see you. Yeah. Nice to see you too. Thank you, Kwame. So um, I want to present, uh, give a short presentation also of Kwame. Uh, he is member of the Executive Committee of Friends of the Earth International at Friends of the Earth in Togo. Kwame is a very well-known environmental activist with vast experience and knowledge on policy, advocacy, and campaigns. And of course, uh, Kwame uh, also, uh, I'm sorry, can, can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, thank you so, so much. So um, uh, he is the lead of promotion of agroecology and community forest management campaign in Togo. He is the Global Forest Coalition Africa Regional Facilitator and is the human rights defender, local person and membership development team representative for Friends of the Earth Africa. Kwame works on climate issues with focus on denouncing fossil fuels land grabbing, agro-commodities, and monoculture plantations. So today, Kwame will uh, talk about an uh, interesting um, topic that it's called From Investment to Corporate Power in Africa. Thank you so much, Kwame. So now you have uh, 10 minutes to talk. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me loudly? Um, yeah, so um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I'll just uh, present from my, my screen. And also just uh, want to quickly correct uh, on my view. Uh, I was I a was, uh, member of uh, Friends of the International Executive Committee, but uh, now I'm not. Uh, so thank you for your uh, Thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, uh, few minutes, please. I, I would like to uh, to check some some technical issue. Uh, 
and uh, forget but okay no so um sorry according according to uh, the livestock data uh, innovation in africa agriculture and business including livestock have been among the fastest growing sector since uh, 1990s. Uh, if you hear uh, all the presentation that have passed, uh, it's focused on the vision of uh, uh, livestock in Africa. So I'm going also to highlight some, some, some few, few elements uh, about the vision uh, and uh, I'll proceed. So, uh, I was, I was saying that uh, 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 agriculture and business, including livestock in Africa, uh, have been among the fastest growing sectors since 1990s and uh, the growing demands for food and high value agricultural products such as meats and dairy in particular is setting the stage for continual opportunities for investment. Um, according to the World Bank, in uh, 25 and 27, uh, beef and poultry were the two most consumed meats. Uh, 4.7 uh, million of tons uh, for beef consumption and uh, 2.9 million tons of uh, poultry consumption. Uh, so by 2050, the, the, the consumption of uh, these two meats uh, is estimated to increase by 8.9 uh, million of tons. Um, so, so you you see you see how uh, they are projecting uh, in 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 our, in Africa uh, uh, the consumption of meats. I think it's kind of uh, a strategy. So people are putting in the, uh, the, how do you call it, the invisible uh, hands are putting already in the people that projection. Um, in, 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 in some countries, uh, some national policies towards pastoral areas have not been driven by the desire to protect and develop subsistence livestock but rather by the desire to modernize the livestock production methods in order to meet the growing urban demand for meats and other animal products. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going quickly to uh, highlight, I'm going to highlight the, the history of foreign investments into agriculture and food in Africa. And, and also highlight the, the vision uh, for livestock uh, in Africa, the impacts of uh, extensive livestock on forests, some just a few lines, and uh, also speak to the influence of corporates or investors in livestock sector in Africa. So regarding the investments in food sector and vision for livestock in Africa, uh, I would like just to give you this, uh, these uh, few elements. But before that, it's important to recall that uh, in the wake of the food crisis, foreign investments and public investments poured into agricultural research in Africa favored agribusiness expansion. So you, you, may, you may recall that in 26, the Gate Foundation joined Rockefeller Foundation to launch the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA. So, you know, you all know what AGRA uh, has been doing uh, in, in agriculture sector. So to boost, uh, to boost agribusiness in, in Africa, uh, you may recall also that the, the former U.S. President Barack Obama in 2012 launched the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. So uh, it is uh, a multi-year, multi-donor effort focused on uh, agribusiness-led public-private partnership as the vehicle for African agriculture development. So those are, those are the, the indicators that are showing clearly that uh, investors are having their mind in agriculture in Africa. They want to invest more 
in Africa and also in livestock. By 2030, the value of agriculture and agribusiness industries in sub-Saharan Africa is projected to reach one trillion uh, US dollar compared to uh, uh, 313 billion US dollar in 2010. So you just look at the, the big, the big uh, uh, increase from 2010 and the projection to 2030. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's very important uh, to critically uh, look at the strategy or the, and, and the policies of, uh, of livestock uh, uh, in Africa. So those, those are, are, are also incorporate livestock sectors. The, the, the investments in agriculture include also uh, livestock uh, uh, sector. So uh, uh, given the, the, the current consumption trends in animal protein, the livestock sector, which nowadays uh, account for almost one third of uh, the value added of African agriculture, is anticipated to become one of the main, if not the largest contributor to agriculture in the coming decades. So the, the, the indicators are, are really clear. And uh, I thank you to Tozi also who, who uh, uh, did mention uh, those, uh, those, uh, those figures. So in its vision uh, of developing livestock farming in West Africa uh, on large scale, and more specifically, the, the marketing of meat cattle, ECOWAS, ECOWAS uh, uh, Economic uh, 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 Organization, uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you know ECOWAS, it's an uh, economical body of uh, West Africa. Uh, so through its uh, specialized technical structure, it's uh, uh, um, the, 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 the specialized technical structure is the Regional Agency for Agriculture and Food, we call it ARA, uh, is very much active in agriculture sector. So through, through uh, ECOWAS, through its specialized uh, uh, agency, uh, has uh, had, had a budget of uh, uh, 3 million uh, of US dollar in 2019 for uh, call for proposal. So uh, countries should apply to develop, to increase the uh, livestock uh, 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 production. And this funding, uh, this uh, was the financial support from uh, the, the Swiss Agency for Development and Corporation, SDC, as you know. So the, the, the African, the African uh, livestock market hold the potential to generate major business opportunities for livestock producers. In many cases, larger than those of other regions. Yeah, uh, there is a comparison between uh, uh, Latin America and Africa. But according to the studies between uh, 25th, uh, 25th and 27th, and 20. 50, Africa's increase in the volume of meat consumed will notably be on a par with that of the developed world and that of Latin, Latin America. So you, you know what's going on in Latin America, whereby uh, the meat consumption is, is also high. Uh, and also in, in, in South Asia and, and East South Asia, uh, the meat also high. So the project, the project, <clears throat> the projection is that uh, uh, African markets will be higher than uh, 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 Latin America and South Asia in in the in the future. So the annual growth rates in both meat and milk consumption are also projected to be higher in Africa than in other regions. So it's it clearly means that what we are talking here. It's just nearby. It's just nearby, and we need we need clearly to put in place uh, some of the the measures uh, as civil society organizations uh, uh, to block 
and to uh, oppose uh, that mindset of bringing uh, 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 the, the, the meat consumption in high scale uh, with, among uh, African population. We, 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 we need uh, our own uh, way of um, breeding uh, uh, the animals so that we live in harmony with, uh, with the nature. So that was the history of investments and the future of the livestock. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the, the livestock and forest in Africa. What, what, uh, uh, what exactly uh, the impact of livestock uh, uh, on forest in Africa? I thank uh, uh, John Caesar to bring some, uh, some, some of the elements in. So in, in, in Africa, uh, the, cattle, the cattle breeding is practiced in the, in the savannah forests, most of in West, in, 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 in West and in Saharan Africa. Uh, the uh, 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 large scale livestock farming required more land. And Africa today accounts for 45% of the world's large scale land investments followed by Asia with uh, 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 37%. But across the continent in Africa here, the top 10 countries targeted by local and international investors account for 70% of the land deals concluded and 54% uh, of the large scale land investment agreement. So those are we can we can cite uh, Kenya, Tanzania among 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 those uh, those countries. Uh, maybe even South Africa. Maybe uh, the majority of uh, these transactions in Africa, seven seventy three percent, are by foreign investors. So the interest in this type of investment is mainly driven by the global food security issue, combined. Combined investment in agriculture and livestock account for 87% of all such transactions. So just, just hearing this, you can see clearly that the more investments, more power for investors and less, less power for, for, for the countries, for the government and for, and for their people. So the development of uh, extensive farming system is widely denounced as a major cause of deforestation. The rapid expansion of uh, ranching is the third cause of uh, tropical deforestation and the first in the formation of degraded land. So one of the study uh, I've just came across uh, has shown that the arrival of uh, Fulani pastoralists and their livestock in the, in the Zande, Zande locality in the east of the, of the Central African Republic has uh, altered the balance of the forest savanna mosaic. So the changes observed are very clear and they are significant. So, uh, each pastoralist keeps a high number of animals. So you can see high numbers of animals. If, if the animals are becoming more and more, you see the damage that uh, uh, they, can, they, can, they can bring uh, for our forests and also for the, the land. So each pastoralist uh, 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 keeps a high number of, of animals. Breeding practices are aggressive towards the environment. So if if uh, you can't, you can't. Uh, if you have more, more than uh, uh, or extensive uh, livestock, then uh, the environment is uh, in danger. Just to conclude quickly, uh, uh, I would like to conclude with the relationship between the investors, the government, and the people. So, as you may know, all funding or investment come with restrictions guidelines from the investor, which limit the protection power uh, of, of our government. So government doesn't have more power to protect the, the people. So from, from my analysis regarding the meat consumption in Togo, 
uh, it is clear that the, the, the reforms to enable countries to produce and meet locally the needs of the population of the population in Togo are blocked. Why? Because the agriculture and livestock policy are stated clearly that the development of non-conventional breeding should be promoted and also uh, 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 Togo need to process uh, uh, animal production uh, locally. But a study has shown that uh, in 2010, the, the import of meat and offal had cost the Togolese economy 4.9 billion in foreign currency and import of milk and other uh, dairy product also has cost 4.6. So having, having a development uh, policy and receiving funding or investment for, for something else lead, lead to human rights violation for sure. And in that case, our governments are powerless in protecting the people affected by those investments. So we need to push. We need to push for legally binding instrument to hold accountable those investors who are often transnational companies. Fortunately, there is a, a UN treaty process uh, uh, on, on, uh, on binding instruments on transnational corporations and uh, other business uh, enterprises with regard to human rights. So we need, we need to end uh, the pressure of investors on our, our government and the violation of human rights. Uh, we should join the global campaign alongside uh, the UN process. So we need, we need to stop that vision of having uh, uh, extensive uh, uh, livestock that will damage our environment. We, we only need, what we need is our own uh, approach of, uh, of livestock that will promote uh, uh, well-being for, for population. Thank you very much, uh, Milena. Thank you to you, Kwame. Thank you so much for your intervention and these interesting insights. Actually, also, this importance that you gave to the consumption trends that is still being very problematic, that it's also an indicator about the lack of awareness in population. So it's important to continue to remark the importance, well, of course, continue working together, you know, to, to show this, the, the impacts of this, of this kind of, of industry. And of course, uh, also to see this direct uh, impact on countries of Global South. Interesting to, to see how Africa, Latin America, but also Asia, for example, are really um, similar in, in terms of impact, in terms of consumption trends. So thank you so much, uh, Kwame. And also remark something that Janice shared with us in the chat, that it's that uh, AGRA is a special UN uh, envoy to food summit. So it's also worried to see that these possibilities of public par private partnerships could continue increasing. Thank you so much, Kwame. Thank you to all panelists. Um, we have just uh, one question that we received through email, and I want to give these questions to every everybody. So the question is, how has industrial livestock impacted indigenous uh, species and common land grassing? And if you, some of you want to take this question, answer it. Uh, all of you are welcome, of course. So, um, I don't know if maybe one of you want to remark something special about this. Can you, can you repeat the question, please? Of course. The question is, how has industrial livestock impact indigenous uh, lands and common land grazing? Hi, Melina. Uh, 
can I can I jump in maybe, and uh, I might not I might not necessarily um, uh, uh, give an adequate answer to the to the question as it is asked, but uh, what we as an organization uh, that is Cow now, we've um, we've um, taken a decision to say instead instead of maybe um, quoting studies that are done in America or, or even other developed Western countries, why not we do a sub-Saharan study that looks at the impact of factory farming on local communities? So I, I wish this question was asked maybe 18 months from now or maybe 12 months from now when we have questions. But we, we do have an hypothesis, of course, that if a factory farm is established, definitely local markets. Uh, I, I can make an example of um, South Africa is obsessed about malls. Uh, I'm not sure if other countries are as well, but if a mall comes up, the local shop owners in that vicinity definitely die down because everyone tends to go to the mall. It's convenient, everything and every shop and every maybe items are sold there. So hence, factory farming will definitely have such a, an outcome as well to say that if a farmer comes in, in a certain region and sets up a operation that has 10,000 pigs or 20,000 cattle or 50,000 sheep, definitely the smallholder farmer in and around that area will be severely impacted. And those smallholder farmers are mainly women, the youth, and also uh, people who are really struggling and, uh, and to feed themselves. Yeah, that's, that's just my uh, two cents worth of uh, answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tosi. Tosi, thank you for your, yeah, it's, it's really interesting because also it's a similar, you know, phenomenon in, in Latin America. But, well, I don't know if maybe it's, well, someone else wants to take out. Uh, Haruna, ah, okay, sorry, Haruna. Haruna, you want to give some also words? Just wait a minute. Well, I think Haruna, well, he, he just sent us some information about her knowledge, her experience. He is an expert pastoralist in a project of PhD at uh, the University of Niamey. So maybe if we want to continue talking more about the, this topic, Haruna, you will have also the recording of this webinar. And we also will share the names and contacts of all participants. So, if you have maybe other question, we can reach now. If no, well, I just want to 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 give two minutes to each one to a brief, a short close, a word close. So I don't know if maybe we can do a quick round, maybe start with uh, Judy, uh, if you want to close with some words about the experience and insights. Yes, I can maybe say a word or two. Yeah, as uh, from the question, even I can even end with what, with trying to answer the question. Yeah, as long as we have industrial industrial systems, we have to be alert to the fact that the small the small farmers or the small shareholders or the small communities people will not be able to to compete 
competitively with these large more intensive production systems and this will continually increase the um, increase the increase the gulf in between the communities and the large uh, scale and so we need to continue and think of the of the indigenous knowledge in terms of to increase the the, the food options we have because we have there are so many options for the vegetarian and the vegan options and so and as one of the speakers said that the consumption of meat may not increase as the as we are foreseeing in terms of the industrial system itself and so we should look for other sustainable ways for which we can eat and um, improve our agricultural system yeah Thank you, thank you so much, Judy. Um, maybe, uh, well, Janice. Thank you, Milena, thanks. Um, yes, just to say it's been a really interesting discussion. It's been so good to hear everyone's perspectives. And I think the thing that sticks in my mind now is the absolute importance of policy advocacy because this is all driven by pretty high level international policy and fueled by development organizations, international development organizations. And at this time, with the great focus on the environmental crises, particularly climate change and biodiversity loss, and the contribution of industrial animal agriculture to that, and also now the big focus on prevention of future pandemics and the disease risk in industrial animal agriculture i think there's a big scope um, to push hard and to try and stop international policy organizations supporting increased industrialization and to stop recovery finance going to industrial animal agriculture and to stop development organizations from pushing their money into it because they are just paying for future pandemics which are going to destroy everyone's food security everyone's livelihoods and it just doesn't make sense thank you <laughs> yeah it's sadly but it's true thank you so much janice um maybe john now you want to share some insights Yes. For a conclusion, first of all, I would like to thank thank you because you, we exchange uh, exchange a lot of ideas. I would like to conclude saying. We have to raise a collective awareness that everybody is involved. We need everybody to be involved in these environmental questions because the vulnerability related to large scale uh, farming has very a lot of consequences on marginalized groups such as women because especially for the um, in the context of agro-industrial activities And also because they are not owner of the land of the rights to land it's the reason why we have we need a land reform in order to preserve the local co local communities rights their right to protect and take care of their forests in order to change entirely the society. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, that, uh, maybe this is one of the main questions in all the global south, the land. 
policy reform. So Kwame, now it's your turn. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, <clears throat> we need we need to uh, I agree. I agree that we, we need to uh, push for more advocacy by sharing the good uh, practices uh, of uh, uh, small producers. Uh, we need to show what is good for the policymakers. So we need to convince them. So more studies need to be done from our side to show that uh, the, uh, the industrial model is not good. It's not good for us. So coming back on the, on the previous question, I would like to elaborate also on two elements, two points. The first one, uh, the industrial models uh, for sure will, will take away the common, uh, uh, common land gra uh, grazing. Uh, there is land grabbing because of uh, the, the huge amount of, uh, of land the industrial model will take, then the, the small producers will, will be out. And if they are out, then it means they are displaced. So the second point uh, we, we, need, we need to take into consideration is the displacement of the small producers. If they are displaced, then there is conflict somewhere. They're going to create conflict somewhere. So the, the whole livelihood of the small producers are affected by the industrial uh, model of livestock. So we, we need to push. For sure, we cannot, we cannot uh, 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 be sleeping now. Uh, we have more things to do. We, we, need, we need to really push for, for, to, to stop uh, the uh, industrial model in, in, in Africa. And also, uh, we need to make sure that our representatives from uh, Africa in different uh, uh, summits, eh, in different, like EU, ECOA, SADEC, and so on. We need, we need to lobby them very well so that uh, their, their, their representative uh, uh, should be concluded in our favor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to you, Kwame. And thank you to all who wait until the end of this webinar. And for your patience, all the interesting presentations today uh, from Global Forest Coalition. We also want to remark that um, we are leading with, of course, other partners around the globe um, and a campaign around the unsustainable livestock farming and their alternatives. So um, we will have a couple of more webinars from the European perspective and also um, North American perspective. Thank you once again. Uh, we hope to meet you again very soon. And well, that's all for, for today. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Bye. Mm. Thank you, Emma, Pierre. Thank you so much. <laughs>